súper, súper intensa. Ahora estamos terminando de, de, con la técnica del próximo orador internacional, que la verdad que estamos súper, súper contentos de que esté acá. Tengo unos amigos de campuseros de Brasil, están acá, y me enseñaron el grito campusero, así que lo voy a tratar de, tratar de imitar. Y necesito su ayuda un poco para, para acá, para ayudarme a, a, a vivir el espíritu de Campus Party. Así que vamos a tratar de hacerlo. Voy a ver si me sale bien. Buenas tardes, Campus Party. ¡Oh! Nadie me ayudó, más o menos. ¿Me ayudan un poco? A ver, vamos a probar. ¿Vos, vos podés? A ver. Todo el mundo listo. Copia como yo. Nosotros hacemos en Brasil y en todas las partes de Campus Party del mundo. Es muy fácil. Letra O en dos tons. Muy fácil. O. ¿Cómo así? O. Más o menos, más rápido. O. Ahora, ¿cómo no, si... Una vez más. Ok. Ok. Tres. Dos. Uno. Oh. Muy bien, gracias. un aplauso grande, muchas gracias. Vamos a presentar ahora al próximo orador. Él es, antes de convertirse en un cazador de mitos, Grant Imahara era un ingeniero, un ingeniero en animatrónica y un constructor de modelos para Industrial Light, Magic Model Shop de George Lucas en Marine Country, California. Allí se especializó en electrónica y control de radio, y trabajó en la producción de varias películas, como Jurassic Park, El Mundo Perdido, Star Wars, Episodio 1, La Amenaza Fantasma, Galaxy Quest, Inteligencia Artificial, Terminator, etcétera, etcétera, etcétera. Así que, sin mucho más preámbulo, le doy un aplauso enorme, demos un aplauso enorme para recibir a Grant y Mahara. Aplauso enorme, por favor. Ahí se está acercando, un súper orgullo poder presentarlo. Y un pequeño recordatorio de producción, y vamos a decirlo con otro aplauso ahora, es la última charla con traducción simultánea, así que les pido por favor devolver los receptores al finalizar la charla. Y ahora sí está acá con nosotros, un aplauso enorme para Grant y Mahara. Aplauso enorme. Hello, how are you? Hi, Campus Party. Hello, everyone. Hi, Campus Party Argentina, how are you? Excellent. It's my honor to be speaking to you today. I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, my career as a myth buster, but also in special effects. And all of the things that I learned along the way that I want to share with you. Now, Many of you know me from the show Mythbusters, where we have, uh, that's me, Adam, Jamie, Carrie, and Tori, and Buster. Buster, our crash test dummy. Buster does all the hard work for us. The show Mythbusters started when a producer named Peter Reese had the idea to hire people to investigate urban legends. But these people had to be special. They had to be able to build the experiments, perform the experiments, and figure out the investigation for themselves. Originally, it was just Adam and Jamie, and then afterwards, they decided that they needed help And so they hired a build team, me and Tori and Carrie. Many of the things that we test on Mythbusters have to do with things that people believe, like uh, driving very closely behind a large vehicle, a large truck, will save you fuel. As a matter of fact, it does. But there's two problems. Number one, generally speaking, it's illegal. 
Number two, it's very, very dangerous. Don't do it. It's not worth it. Other things we have are historical myths, like the Huacha, fired off 400 arrows in uh, ancient Asia to try and defeat their enemies. What we found is that it wasn't a weapon of destruction. It was a weapon of intimidation. When you see 400 arrows flying through the sky at you, you look at that and it makes you afraid and you run away. Another one we've done is bird balance. In the movies, you see two guys trying to get away in a car. They drive all the way up to the edge and they stop and they're balanced and then a bird comes and lands right on the hood and that's enough to send them right over. Uh, it doesn't work. Sorry, it's not everything in the movies that you see works. This one, this one is just a convenient story device. As it turns out, I had to build a, a chandelier that, was, that held uh, 40 frozen turkeys, weigh about maybe 10 pounds each. Dropped them one by one. I think it took 23 turkeys to make the car tip over. So it, it doesn't work in real life. But these are the kinds of things that we look at. Can you cut down a tree? Using a machine gun? Yes, you can. If you have a big enough machine gun, which we had. <laughs> Sometimes what we do is build things that didn't exist. In this one, we're trying to catch a, a pig, a greased pig, and the pig, little, little pig, runs around really fast, very hard to catch. So I built these claws that extend my arms several feet and then they, they grab. They grab the pig by the leg. They don't cut the leg because it stopped, right? So just grab it. Still very hard to catch, but these are the kinds of things that we build. And finally, some of the things we do are just um, silly, like, like Superman. You know, Superman changes in a phone booth like really, really quick. We wanted to see how hard it was to change in a phone booth. Uh, I think I was able to change in about a minute. By then, probably the emergency is already over. And then some things we do are very big, like the Jado rocket car. I say here version 3. I'll come back to this later. Versions 1 and 2 didn't quite work out. You would say, you might say that they were a failure. And then, when you hear the word failure, you, you feel bad. I want to talk about this later, but failure is not something to feel bad about. We tried it the first two times, it didn't work out. Version 3, still didn't quite work out, but that's okay. Now the part I want to share with you. In the beginning, I was much like you, Camposeros, probably about um, 19, 20 years old, in college. I was studying engineering. I'm a technical guy, as you probably know. Electrical engineering. I was at a point in my life where I wasn't sure if I wanted to continue with what I was doing. And so I went to the cinema school where I found a guy who ended up being my mentor. His name, Tomlinson Holman. You might not know his name, but you've probably heard the THX sound system in the theaters. That was his invention. In fact, the TH stands for Tom Holman and the X is experiment, THX. 
The thing that's great about finding a mentor is that they've already done everything that you want to do. And many of them are eager to share their knowledge with you. Tom used to take me to meetings. He used to give me things to read, and we would have discussions about them. In return, I was organizing his office. He's, he's a man with a long history of working in engineering, in sound, and as a result, he has stacks and stacks and stacks of papers. So I ended up organizing his office, and eventually, he got me my first job at THX as a summer intern. And if you have an opportunity to be an intern, this is a very powerful tool. It certainly launched my career. Because as an intern at THX, they didn't necessarily have to pay me. So they, and, and I wasn't, rather, they paid me, but I wasn't an employee. I didn't have any benefits. It was just for a short period of time. This allows them to get to know you as a worker and allows you to get to know them. And there's a set period, usually, usually three months. At the end of the three months, you get to go away, and if it works as it did in my case, they say, after you are done with school, come back and we will hire you because we know that you're a good worker and we want you to work with us. So if you have this opportunity to become an intern, I highly recommend it. Be available to opportunity. So, my first job at THX. My job, by the way, not unlike Mythbusters, blowing up amplifiers and loudspeakers for THX. Just turning it up to 11 and making them cook. That was what I had to do. That's, if it survived my testing, then it became an official THX product. I was working there three years. And then... Some friends of mine who worked in Industrial Light and Magic said, we need some help. Industrial Light and Magic did special effects. You work in engineering. You know electronics. We are working on Men in Black, Mars Attacks, and Jurassic Park, The Lost World, all at the same time. We need help. You could help us. And I thought, oh, what if, I already have a career at THX, what if I'm, I'm not good? What if I'm afraid to take this opportunity? And you will have a point in your life where you have to make a decision. Do I take this opportunity? And you will be afraid, and that is okay. Fear is part of the equation. It's okay to be afraid, but do not let that stop you from taking that opportunity. I went to my general manager, my boss, actually not my boss, my boss's boss's boss, the head of the division. Her name is Monica Dashwood. I said, Monica, what should I do? And she said, this is what I do. And this is advice that I've taken that guided me in many instances. If I have an opportunity, I take it. Because you never know if that opportunity will come again. And so I did. I took a two-week leave of absence. I told my boss, I, I, I'm just going to try this out. I have to take this chance. And they were, they were very kind. And so that two-week leave of absence turned into nine years of working in special effects. My job in special effects was to do mechanics and electronics. Like this falls into a couple categories. 
here on The Lost World, sequel to Jurassic Park. I did the lights. You see, in those days, computer graphics hadn't gotten to the point that it is now. In those days, we still made models, like physical models with wood and metal and plastic and glue, lots of glue. <laughs> and so to make those models realistic, you have to put little lights in them, which is what I did. This Galaxy Quest, you know Galaxy Quest? It's a Star Trek spoof with Tim Allen. In Galaxy Quest, just like Star Trek, there's a ship, and their ship is called the Protector. I put the lights inside of the Protector, and if you know anything about programming, that's a PIC 16C84 microcontroller inside each of the warp nacelles to sequence the lights. Because in those days, kids, Arduino didn't exist yet. <laughs> they call it the Dark Ages. This led to working on Star Wars. This is the Federation battleship, uh, a real physical model, 11 feet in diameter. This is me, I'm looking very young. This is Tori Malachi from Mythbusters with bad hair and a bad goatee. <laughs> I know, we we're just kids. But that was our background. That was how we got to be Mythbusters, is that we were working together in special effects. Worked on Star Wars Episode 2, Trade Federation Hangar, more of the same. Episode 3, putting more lights in. But as I said, doing miniature lights was only half my job. You can see here all the things I've worked on, including uh, Matrix, Terminator, Van Helsing. Last movie I worked on was Triple X2, State of the Union. Eh. <laughs> The other half of my job was making things move. In this case, the Energizer Bunny. Energizer Bunny sells batteries. You might recognize him. Inside of the Energizer Bunny, he's a real puppet. He has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, about uh, more than a dozen servos inside of him, tiny motors. I did all the electronics for the bunny. This is, this is the third generation of Energizer bunnies. They came to us and said, can you make the bunny, you have to do two things. Number one, can you make the bunny beat consistently? Right, because he beats a drum, they put the sound in later. I said, sure, what are you doing right now? They said, okay, well we've got a guy. Okay, guy has a controller, right? and he listens to a metronome that goes click, 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 and then he, he does it with his fingers. I'm like, you're doing it with his fingers, really? And they're like, yeah, that's how we do it. I'm like, okay, I can do that. What's the other part? The bunny has to run on Energizer batteries. The Energizer bunny, he has to run on Energizer batteries. So I'm like, okay, I can make that happen. The thing is, they didn't tell me exactly how many batteries I could use. I used 44 <laughs> AA batteries. They went in a pack about this big, like curved, like an AK-47 clip that went inside the drum. Because you see, with consumer grade batteries for safety. They can't put out the kind of current that you need. Imagine if you put a battery in your pocket and your keys touch it and your pocket bursts in the flames. Nobody wants that. So that's why I had to use so many batteries in parallel. Energizer Bunny, by the way, requires three operators. Now my first job on the Bunny, since I did all the electronics, I run the arms. Pretty easy job. All I do is flip a switch. My microcontroller controls the beat precisely. This crystal it synchronizes it exactly every time. 
I flip the switch, I flip another switch, he twirls, flip another switch, and it goes back down to beating. Second job is the head. I, I should probably just show you. Okay, I'll show you. Typical Energizer Bunny commercial. Bunny comes in, right, beating the drum, goes like this, and then when he's done, he goes, hey, what's up? <laughs> right? That's the Energizer Bunny. So, the second job is the head. You have to do the, hey, what's up, right? And the third job and the hardest job, which I eventually worked my way up to, was the driver. Why is the driver so hard? Remember where all the batteries are in the top here? It makes the bunny very top heavy. So if you spin quickly, he'll fall over, which is very bad. The other thing is that each bunny, I, I cannot tell you how much they cost each, but if you know what a Ferrari Testarossa is, <laughs> it's about that. As a result, as you are driving your bunny very close to an edge, you don't want to drive over the edge, or else that's a Ferrari Testarossa that just went down. R2-D2 is another project I worked on. I know there's an R2 here somewhere, right? I'll take a look at him later. I'm a child of the 70s. I grew up, I was seven years old when Star Wars came out. R2-D2 was like a personal hero of mine. It's really, I think, where my love of robots came from. Is that, you know, it, it identified the robot as a friend. Originally, <laughs> originally, when robotics weren't where they are today, many of the shots had a guy inside of them. Kenny Baker. He passed away recently, rest his soul. And some of them, some of the shots, had a robot. How do you tell the difference between a human and a robot R2-D2? You count the legs. You see, here, in the two-legged R2, Kenny, who's a small guy, had put one foot in each pod, and then he gets down. And the robot, for stability, when you're driving around, you need that third leg. So imagine you grew up with Star Wars, part of your childhood, and your boss comes in and says, hey, 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 Monday, you're going to be working on R2-D2. If there is such a thing as a, a nerdgasm, that's what I had right there. This, this moment of, of my childhood colliding with my professional life. And I said, yes, as a matter of fact, I would love to work on R2-D2. I would love to redo all of the electronics and modernize them and make things more reliable, use less power, because if you are running R2-D2 on set, you have 100 people watching you. Various departments, lighting, grip, sound. In addition to all of your talent, you don't want to be in a situation ever where you have to say, oh, sorry, sorry, just a minute, I just need to change the R2-D2 battery. So using as little power as possible is something that you strive for, something that is desirable, and likely will save your job. Ah, <laughs> droid, droid proctologist. This, <laughs> by the way, this is, uh, 
This is a, a land speeder, if you uh, are, are sharp enough. That was at the archive building. And there are many, many R2-D2s. Why are there so many? Well, you have, uh, this is Don Bees, by the way. He's the head of the R2-D2 crew. You have a unit, a backup, which is the B unit, just in case something goes wrong. Those are for maneuvering near people, so they're slower but more precise. And there's the running units, A and B, really fast. Let's say you're running down a hangar and you have to have R2-D2 keep up. That's the one that you use, the fast one. There's stunt ones that you throw off. There's Kenny ones. There's a stunt one that you, I don't know, throw off of something and you, you abuse it. That one's okay to abuse. So there's a lot of different ones there. In your career, you're not going to know all the answers. In fact, after 20 plus years of working in special effects, I don't know all the answers. I go to the internet. You are going to be in a situation where you don't know the answers. And that's fine. It is up to you to find those answers. When I was competing in BattleBots, 1999, not the, not the current one. Oh, goodness, seven, 17 years ago? Yeah, OK. Wow. We didn't have websites that you could go to to buy robot parts. Nobody knew what kind of motors you were going to use. People barely knew, outside of certain industries, how to work with titanium. And so, in order to build my ultimate robot, my fighting robot, I had to go and find all these things and try different technologies, things that weren't normally used with radio control, like scuba tanks, in order to get high-pressure air. But it's what I had to do, because I didn't know all the answers. Nobody had all the answers, and you do you shouldn't be afraid to look for those answers. As it turns out, I did very well in BattleBots. I won, I won two scrimmages, two, two matches, like a, a final match. They call it a rumble, where all the robots in the arena all at once. Last man standing wins. I won two of those. And I came in second place overall one year. So I have two giant nuts and one small one. <laughs> Some people think, thank you. When I was designing my robot, I went to acrylic first. And, and I was at Industrial Light and Magic, so I was, I was using the facilities that we had. I called it training. And as a matter of fact, it was training because putting in all these hours, you know, after work, right, I would stay till midnight or so every night working on my robot. After work, and then during the day, I could be much faster. I started out with acrylic and then moved on to aluminum. And there's my robot. They did very well. They made a toy out of them, dead blow. Sometimes you can find vintage toys. And also, they asked me to write a book, which I did. And, you know, this is a long time ago, but a lot of the things that are in the book are still applicable. If you can find it, it's a really good book. I put everything I know into that book. This is the last topic. And... I say do something crazy. It's not like go out and you know, run down the street um, throwing your arms in your underwear or anything like that. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is that you can think outside of the box. Which brings me to Jeff Peterson. Jeff Peterson is a talking robot skeleton. 
that I made for a late night television host by the name of Craig Ferguson. Originally, he approached me and, and his show was on CBS, it was a major network show. But it was always a joke that he didn't have enough money. He didn't get enough money from CBS. So his set was shabby and he didn't have enough lights and he didn't have a co-host. So he said, I want a co-host. And what's more, he's going to be a robot and, and even more than that, he's going to be a skeleton and he's going to talk. <laughs> and so they, they knew Craig and his son were big fans of Mythbusters when we had been on, on his talk show, The Late Late Show, a few times. And he thought, this is a guy that can do this for me. I want Grant Imahara to make my robot skeleton co-host. So we got on a conference call. And he said, and, and he was so excited, he wanted to be on the call himself. And I said, okay, I can do all the technical parts of this. What, what, kind of, what kind of robot skeleton do you want? Do you want like Terminator, right? I can make it super high tech and uh, chrome and really cool. And he's like, no. I want it to be a cheap plastic skeleton, just like in a laboratory classroom. And I'm like, okay, well, you want him to talk, right? He goes, yes. I said, do you want him to do all these other movements? He's like, no. I just want one arm and one talking head. That's it. Like, are you sure, Craig? This is, he's like, yes, this is absolutely what I want. And, and originally, they wanted it to be delivered in four days. I'm like, I can't do it in four days because I'm, I'm working full time on Mythbusters. There's a lot of electronics involved here, a lot of mechanics. I was like, okay, I'll do it in four weeks. I'll give you an update each week. And the guts of Jeff are very similar to other things I've worked on in the past. So, uh, some high power servos. These are actually in R2-D2's head. Uh, the power supplies, the controller boards. Eh, most of them are pretty similar. Uh, this is a, a more modern circuit than, than what I've used in the past. But I essentially had free reign to do whatever I wanted. That was super crazy. So I was like, okay, what could I do that could be different. If I made the eyes red, it's a little too aggressive. Amber, not so much. So I tried blue, perfect. And the other thing is I gave him a mohawk, because why not? <laughs> Four weeks later, I delivered Jeff. Jeff became a hit on the show. And they dressed him in this weird kind of suit, like post-apocalyptic suit. I don't know why, but became part of his character. And the thing is, and this is the thing that Craig did on his show a lot. <laughs> I know. He took the format. See, in America, late night TV shows, they all have the same format. There's a band, there's a co-host, they have guests. Craig did something different. Instead of like doing the regular thing, he had puppets, like hand puppets on the show, and the puppets would sing. And he had two guys in a horse costume. One guy's the front, one guy's the back, and they would gallop around the studio. And he had Jeff Peterson, the talking robot skeleton. And this is something that made him successful was doing things differently, doing something crazy. What I have to say to you, and the most important thing, is take 
a chance. Remember when I talked about failure earlier? A lot of people think, oh, I don't know if I want to take this chance. What if I fail? What if I fail? If I fail, that's the end. Failure is something we need to learn from. We need to rewrite that code. Often, we are told that failure is bad. People ask me, what did I learn from 10 years on Mythbusters? The number one thing I learned is that failure is good. Failure is something you learn from. You consider all of these things as prototypes. When I build things, you don't get it 100% right the first time every time. You have a series of prototypes. You try things out. If something doesn't work, you change it, and the next time around, you make it better. That's all life is. It's a series of prototypes. You may know that Mythbusters is done, and it was an incredible 10 years of bringing science to the world, bringing science to, to young people, and making it something that was fun and cool, which it is. It is. It shouldn't have the stigma of being uncool, because it is fun. And really, science and engineering are the basis of everything that we have, all of our computers, everything, our cell phone that we carry with us around every day, science and engineering. But don't be sad, because we have a new show. It's called The White Rabbit Project. I'll tell you a little bit about this show, and then we're going to answer some questions. It's basically me and Tori and Carey, same people, doing similar things. There's not going to be any myths, but we build things, we sometimes crash vehicles, I make robots, and we have a lot of fun, and I think you're really going to like it. So that's coming out very soon on Netflix. All right, do we have time for questions? Okay, good. Give me the thing. Okay. Yes. Can you do your traditional selfie with the composers? Oh, yeah. Of course. I almost forgot. Wait. Before we do that, we're going to do a selfie, Camposeros. Yeah. It's happening. All right. Ready? One, two, three. <laughs> okay, awesome, thank you. <laughs> That's great, thank you. Thanks for reminding me. Okay, does this work? Yes? Okay, if you have a question, raise your hand, and I will try to throw this to you. All right, you ready? I don't know how people don't get hurt doing this. No, no. Hi. Um, with all your experience, which is the project that you are most proud of, and um, for the other side, the, the one that you are less proud of? <laughs> there are so many projects out there. Let's see. Um, I have done a project recently it's, it's hard to say what the most proud of I, I am. Probably my robot dead blow, which was one of the first things that I had an idea. I first, to go back, I went to the show. I went to, it used to be a live event that you could buy tickets for and go and watch robots fight. So I went as a spectator one year, and I thought, oh, that's amazing. I want to do this. I want to have my own robot. And so I came up with the whole idea for the robot. I did all the research, as I was talking about, 
and built almost all of it myself. In fact, the very first one, I did build myself. And right up until just before it rolled into the arena to fight, I'm like putting screws in and trying to, to make sure it all works. So that, I think to me, that going from, from nothing, from just an idea to a finished thing that ended up being incredibly fulfilling for me personally. Project that I'm least proud of, let me think. Um, I love them all, I really do. Let me think, um, what have I done? Uh, I did do this thing for a guy. He wanted to have an infrared receiver that, um, like for a hotel, right? To be able, a really cheap infrared receiver that could repeat the signal. And he would put it inside of like a picture frame. Um, unfortunately, I didn't, <laughs> I, my first prototype didn't work. And then he, he was so upset that he didn't want me to do any more prototypes. So unfortunately, I didn't get to, to really get to the end of that project. So um, sadly, you won't be seeing that particular project on any so shelves Spanish. soon. Good Spanish. OK, good. good. Great. OK. All right. Excellent. OK, give me back the thing. Or is it, yeah. Give us another question. Oh, you guys another guy? Okay. Pass it over to him so I don't have to throw it. What do you think about the future of robots? Oh, it's a great question. Okay. I'm often asked as a robotics expert, what's the future of robots? Should we be afraid of robots? I'm not going to say no. I'm not going to say yes. But here's what I have to say. In the immediate future, Robots are going to become more a part of our daily lives. And it's not, when, when people say robots with us, they think like, you know, like C-3PO, like humanoid robots. But what I'm talking about are cars that drive themselves, that are smart enough to avoid people and obstacles, that will help relieve traffic. This technology already exists. The biggest roadblock that we have is people accepting it. We'll see robots in our homes helping us with our daily lives. Biggest problem with that, something called the uncanny valley. If you work in robots, you understand what the uncanny valley is. Uncanny valley is where a robot has to look not like a human at all, or it has to be so human-like you can't tell the difference. Between those two extremes is called the uncanny valley, where anything that doesn't quite look human makes you feel uncomfortable, is creepy. And so this is something that we have to overcome, we have to find a way around. Already, you're seeing things like the Amazon Echo with Alexa in your home that you, you just talk to, and you can order things. Mostly you can order things and control the lights and the temperature, but eventually, an interface like that, that can do more than just turn on and off lights, could help you with dishes, help the elderly, help children, that's something that I see coming fairly soon. Artificial intelligence, people wonder about, what about the Terminator scenario? Artificial intelligence, if it truly came about, it would happen very quickly, it would advance very quickly. The thing is, I don't think that we're there yet. I don't think it's gonna be in the next 10 years. Maybe the next 20. Should we be afraid? I don't know. We'll see. We'll see when we get there. 
Next question. Brands? Um, well, uh, the Mythbusters yes. are one of my most important influences to make me study physics. Yes. Um, you're one of my childhood heroes. Thank you. And I think I talk for a lot of us when I say thank you so much for make us learn and love science. Thank you very much. I do a lot of these talks at, at educational institutions, people who are in university, and one of the most gratifying things about my career is when a young person will come and say, because of you and what you've done, I'm, I'm studying physics and making my life better, or, or studying engineering, and especially women, for a long time. Women were not interested in the sciences, or maybe not because they weren't interested, but they felt like they, they couldn't do it, that somehow math and science and engineering were beyond them. Many of them have come to me and said, because of your show, because of seeing you and Tori and Carrie, and mostly Carrie, doing science and making it look fun, I now feel like I can study science as a woman and, and study engineering and study math. And I think that that's very important. So thank you. How are we doing? Good? Time for three, four, one more? One more. Okay. Okay, one more question. They're throwing the ball. Could all go horribly wrong. Yes! All right. Go ahead. Hi, it's an honor to be here hearing you. I wanted to ask, you. what is uh, your greatest mistake, talking about failure, uh, <laughs> the one you feel most proud and you took more advantage about? Okay. Um, let me see here. What have I... <laughs> I will tell you... Um, we're often asked, are there any episodes of Mythbusters that didn't air? Now, people know that there's the farting one, right? If not, you can look it up on, on, on YouTube. It's, it's, it's a really good episode, but for various reasons, we didn't air that one. There's only one episode I know of on Mythbusters that didn't air. And it's rare that something that you work on a myth and it doesn't air because so much time and energy and money goes into creating the show. There was a myth called Squash Weightlifter. If you grow a pumpkin, right? As the pumpkin grows, it pushes out with enough force to lift a car. Pretty good myth. So we got champion pumpkin seeds from Half Moon Bay. There's a great pumpkin festival, gigantic pumpkins. We set up a custom hydroponic garden with special growing lights that rotated around. Put our champion pumpkin seeds in this garden. For six weeks, we, we put our, our time and effort into filming this myth. We could not grow any pumpkins. <laughs> we are horrible, horrible gardeners. We, so you have a green thumb, we, we had a black thumb. It was just not good. Um, unfortunately, we didn't get a, another chance to, to try that particular myth. They didn't have any confidence in our ability to grow pumpkins. But 
What did I learn from that? Probably next time around, we'll get an expert gardener. Okay, thanks a lot, Campus Party. Thank Demo you very much. Aplauso enorme a Grant. Thanks, Grant. Thank you. I will ask you another selfie. Oh, Vamos yeah. Vamos a otra selfie más. Okay. A ver. Up, up. Okay. Vamos a hacer otra más. A ver. Yeah. Muchas gracias, muchas gracias. Okay, thanks. thanks. I'm going to put this on Snapchat. Ready? A Snapchat video. Okay, I'm looking. Yeah. Oh! El grito campusero. All right, thanks, thank you Grant. very much. Un aplauso enorme <laughs> para Grant y Mahara. Thanks, Grant. Muchas gracias, Grant. Gracias a todos. Les recuerdo ahora algunos anuncios parroquiales. A las 8 en Serie Innovación ta, transmitimos la final de Counter-Strike en vivo. Ahora en minutos arranca Serie Innovación. Por favor recuerden devolver los receptores de la traducción simultánea. Y a las 9 nos encontramos nuevamente acá para escuchar a Fly Bondi, Julián Cook, hablándonos acá en Serie Magistral. Buenas tardes para todos. Gracias. Y el Catchbox, el Catchbox... Gracias. Escenario de innovación. Escenario de innovación, la final de Counter-Strike. Gracias.